Well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, uh, wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Dr. Felicia Caponigri of Notre Dame Law School, and I am a member of the organizing committee of ICONS. It is such a pleasure today to give a very short introduction to a scholar and member of our academic community who certainly needs no introduction. Professor Weiler is the co-editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Constitutional Law and will be sharing his wonderful workshop today, a conference is aimed at publishing an edited book. Uh, I can say from past experience that my junior colleagues and I always look forward to Professor Weiler's workshops at the annual Icon S conference. We learn so much and so I'm delighted that we were able to have this virtual edition this year. So without further ado, Professor Weiler, I give the floor to you. Thank you very much. And thank you for all those, despite being out Zoomed, who are participating in this. Uh, like a good lawyer, I will start uh, with a disclaimer. Uh, I'm gonna start with a monologue, just run through the points I want to make. And I follow the example of The Economist, the magazine, uh, exaggerate and simplify. Uh, so apologies for that. I will be exaggerating and I will be somewhat simplifying. And the other disclaimer is that I will present my views uh, in a very categorical way. This is how I think the right way to do it. But uh, I am aware that I'm not infallible. I'm not the Pope yet. And uh, so many of the things you might disagree with, but what I think, what I hope to persuade you is that at least the points I'm touching with rather than the answers I give to those points are worth thinking about when you uh, have in mind beginning a project which is meant to end up with an edited book. Uh, so the first point is that an awful lot of edited books being published. Uh, there are many reasons for this, but one of the principal reason is the quantitative pressure that is now imposed on academia by various stakeholders, the state, the universities, the deans, uh, funding, etc., to be productive and to be visible and to show impact. So one of the easiest ways of doing this is to have some kind of conference and invite papers and then come out with an edited book. And in that way, it seems that you are fulfilling all the, those pressures because you are productive, there's an edited book, and you are visible because there's a big conference and people attend and there's a big festa uh, around this. But it comes with a price because, and it comes with a price because at the end of the day, I find it self-defeating. Uh, most edited books in my experience sink without trace in the sense that they don't leave an impact on the field. Uh, a large proportion of this of them, and this I've actually checked empirically, never get reviewed or get at most one or two reviews. And this is true also for the contributions to those books. So the reason it's relatively easy to organize this thing is because when you invite people to participate in such an event, it's very difficult to say no, including for young scholars, because, oh, I'm invited, that's important, and I will be visible, and I will have another publication, which I can put on my list and show to the dean that I published four things or five things last year. But uh, very often, it's not the best work that the contributor could make. And again, just as with the book itself, uh, I've often said, so as an example of simplifying and exaggerating, publishing in an edited book is very often like a cemetery for the contribution. What's wrong with these books? And there are exceptions. We all know the exceptions. But ask yourself, uh, in the last year or two, how many edited books did you actually pick up and read through? Probably very few. And usually the practice is at best, if your Google search or other way of academic search comes up with a title to a contribution to the edited book, you will track it down. But an edited book is not meant to be like a journal in hard covers that you just pick and choose what interests you. The edited book is meant to make a contribution, not just by this or that contribution to the book, but also the sum should be greater than the parts. 
And the book itself as a book should have value. And that's where the usual failing is. So what is wrong with these books? So one is very often the content doesn't correspond to the title. Uh, it's in a broad sense, it's about the theme, but when you open the book, the contributions are very dispersed. They all over the place. And we know the reason for that because people are invited, they go to the conference, they give a paper which is somehow related, but really relates to what interests them or what they've written before, etc. And it doesn't always sit well together in the edited book. Second, uh, the, uh, the quality is very uneven. I have a few edited books in front of me now in preparation for the workshop, and I've gone through them again. And sometimes, Usually there are two or three or four contributions which are really excellent. And I keep wondering why was this published in an edited book and not in a more visible place. But then I discover that they were also published in a more visible place. But some contributions are really terrible. They would never pass peer review in any journal. And usually this is from the big names. You, can, you have the feeling that it was written on the back of an envelope on the airplane to the conference, or it's clearly a kind of simplified recycled piece and the editors, it's very difficult for them to reject it or to insist with one of these quote big names, no, this is not up to standard, you have to do more work, etc. So the quality is very uneven. Another feature of these books is uh, that you, you note that they were subject to very little editing actually. Uh, usually the only editing that takes place is copy editing, the copy editor asking about this or that footnote, etc. But you have the feeling that the editors of the book didn't do a real edit in the sense of, I'm not saying correcting the language, but writing to the author as if they were peer reviewers and saying, this is an interesting contribution, you know, ego caressing, but you really have to do this or that, or yeah, there's a contradiction, or there's a big lacuna in what you present, or there's some questions that ask. You have a feeling with uh, edited books that there was very, very little editing. And that's been my experience as contributor to these edited books. Usually after the conference, we, you get a deadline, please send in your final version by such and such a date. And that's the last you hear from the editors. If you ever get a letter is why are you late in your submission? Uh, and finally, another thing that contributes to this kind of quality issue that I'm insisting on when you read the introductions to these edited books, they are usually kind of lazy. In other words, there's one or two pages kind of explaining the problem that the book dealt with. And then there's a roadmap to the book in chapter one, X does this. And in chapter two, Y does this. But you don't have a real substantive introduction that somebody can read and understand this is what this book has contributed to advancing the field. This is the new thesis. This is the new momentum. These are the new issues that has been raised. It really is often no more than the original mission statement when one dreamt up the idea of the book, plus, as I say, this uh, lazy roadmap. So if you agree with me, at least in part, that there really is a problem with edited books, and that in some way it is self-defeating if you yourself are the editor or a contributor to an ed edited book, what could be done? And here I have a kind of de decalogue, 10 points, which I think you ought to tick off when you enter into a project of an edited book. And I have my suggestions of how to address these points. Uh, and my belief is that uh, if you follow this roadmap, uh, this decalogue, there's a much better chance that you will produce a much better edited book and that your edited book will not end up in the sort of slush bin of book review editors and costing 120 euros and selling 201 copies and really uh, be as if it were never published. So point one, number one in the decalogue is planning. Uh, one of the most common mistakes that are made in planning these things is that the focus of the, the planner of the then to be editors is usually on the conference, how to make the conference attractive, how to get the, be the best people that will make the conference attractive, how to get quote big names or 
interesting people so that if they come, other people will also want to come and you can get a room full of people and have a very good show. Uh, and I think this has to be reversed. Uh, instead of thinking of how to make a conference which will be visible and lots of people and make a noise and look, uh, we managed to get so-and-so from Guatemala and so-and-so from Canada, etc. One should start with the book. In other words, say, really the purpose of this whole exercise is to have as good an edited book as possible. And everything should be in function of the book and the conference should follow from the plan of the book rather than the book be, I've had a great conference, now let's just ask the authors to send in this paper and we will publish it. What does it mean to have a book-centered uh, project rather than a conference-centered uh, project? So the first question to ask seems banal, but it's very important. Do I really want to edit such a book? Or is it just for visibility and productivity and all those other pressures that uh, are put in? D does this book coincide with my own agenda? This, I am working on this area. I think I've built up expertise in the area. I really think that this, there's a need for this kind of book. You really have to ask yourself and ask yourself, you kind of imagine in your mind uh, the book as it will emerge and you ask yourself, will it be an interesting book? Would I be interested in reading it? Would the colleagues, would my peer group, would my reference group be interested in having such a book? It's surprising how often people, as I said, focus on the conference. Will it be an interesting conference rather than will the result be a book that is needed, that will be read, that will be commented on, and above all, that will make a real contribution? Uh, so now there's the time factor. From the moment you have the idea, I think I want to take the steps that will end up with an edited book, there's probably going to be at best a two year time lag between that first idea and the time the book hits the shelves, if you're lucky. Because there has to be a lead time for preparation of the conference, you have to give people adequate time to write the contribution, etc. Then you have the conference, then you wait for people to send in their final draft. There's always some people like myself who are late in sending in their contribution. And when you all have it in hand, you have to send it to the publisher and then the production process also takes time. So I think two years from the first idea of the book till the book hitting the shelves is not an exaggeration. It's not a simplification. It's pretty realistic. And then you also have to add, the minute the book hits the shelves doesn't mean that it comes to the consciousness of your readership, because then there has to be marketing, there have to be book reviews. So it might be three and sometimes even longer time before the edited book really enters into the stream of academic and intellectual discourse. So one of the things to think about is, is this idea that I have now, let's do a book about COVID. Uh, will it be an interesting book when it appears three, three years from now? And given that this is the time lag and so many books are obsolete already by the moment that they are published, and can I really imagine that this book will have a shelf life of say five years? In other words, that it's not just a kind of flash in the pan, but it will really make a contribution and become a reference point for people working in the field. So that is also helpful in this first point of the Decalogue in terms of the planning. Uh, and final point on this, on the planning, instead of focusing on the plan for the conference, so who will we invite and what will be the order of the panels, et cetera, et cetera. You are familiar with this. Uh, think of the table of contents of the book and you will see there's a payoff to that, which I will explain in a minute. And first of all, start with imagining the book and this will be the table of contents of the book. This will be the introduction, chapter one, chapter two, uh, chapter seven, chapter 10, how many chapters you imagine and try and see really if it all comes together and there will be a book and it will have these chapters and these chapters will be of high quality. The chances is it will be a book, a good book. And then in function of that, you organize your conference, you organize your meeting. So that's point number one.
the planning, the ideation, the looking forward, taking into account the time lag, etc. cetera. Uh, you also want to think of your readership. Is it a focused readership or horizontal readership? Is it somebody who's interested in third party intervention in investment arbitration, or is it going to be theories of international law, which anybody doing international law will be interested in reading about theories of international law? The second point, so now it's number two in the Decalogue, what form is the conference to take? And here I just want to give you a dichotomy, the difference between a conference and a workshop. So we, we're not talking at all about these mega conference, ICOS, American Society of International Law, etc. But there are two types of gatherings, to give a neutral term, which result in an editable book. One is a conference where you have a panel, panels of speakers. So you might have 15 speakers or 20 speakers organized around panels, usually over two days, etc. You invite as many people to come. So you might have a room with 50 people, 60 people, maybe even 100 people. So you get all that noise and visibility and photographs on the website of your university and on your own Facebook or whatever. And then the people come, they present their papers. There are Q&A, usually it's reduced to O oh, because everybody talks more than the time allotted to them. So there's kind of 10 minutes or 15 minutes from Q&A from the floor, and then it's the next paper. So that is one form of a conference, which at the end still ends up with an edited book of the papers presented at the conference. The other one is the workshop. The workshop is a much more minor affair. Uh, and because in the workshop, you might have the contributors to the chapters and maybe a few more people, the group that with whom you are working. So if they are envisaged 10 chapters, you won't have more than 20 people in the room. And it really is a workshop. And let me already lay down my thoughts here. I think it's infinitely better. If you really have a good edited book in mind, you should not go for the conference model. Although at the end of what I say, I will say where the conference could come in. It should really be a workshop. What are the virtues of the, of the workshop? Uh, it makes it a collective enterprise. In other words, it's not just, oh, I'm going to a conference, I'm going to present a paper and then go back to my hotel, return home and plan my next conference, etc. The contributors become part of a collective enterprise. They are invested in the enterprise. Uh, they get much in a workshop, as we, I will show in a minute, they get much more, many more substantive comments which can actually improve the paper they are commenting on the papers of other contributors. In other words, the scientific, academic, intellectual input into each contribution in a workshop is infinitely higher than at all possible if you opt for the first model, which is the conference model, even the small conference of between 50 and 100 participants. So you lose all that kind of razzmatazz and disability and all the rest, but you have a much more substantive input and hope uh, for the quality of the edited book. So that's my second point, conference workshop. I would always opt for a workshop as an editor because I really want a serious input to the papers that will eventually be chapters in my book. The mission statement. Uh, there's a difference between the mission statement you will send to whoever's funding it, whether it's the Dean or the ERC or Horizon 2020 or whatever, wherever you want to raise money for this project and the mission statement you will send to the contributors. Uh, the mission statement to the funding organization, really the emphasis has to be, why is this an important problem? Why is this a challenging problem? Why will this be important to discuss? Uh, and convince them in the value, the overall, the meta value of the project. You don't go into details. Now, what I've noticed over the years that very often when I get an invitation to participate in a conference which will lead to an edited book, I get some version of the mission statement that was sent to the Dean or the funding agency, et cetera, and then saying, so now we are planning a conference to develop these ideas, we envisage five or six panels, and would you be willing to contribute to the panel on this theme, on that theme, or on another theme? What's the alternative? 
This is how I think a better mission statement to potential contributors should look like. It could start with the mission statement to the funding agencies or to the dean, whoever you're convincing that this is a good project, because really you make the case why this is important. And the contributors to the book should see why you are thinking it's important, what you have in mind, etc. But then, and this becomes critical, you should have something that says, given that we are planning a book, and this is how we envisage the book. We envisage that there will be part one with three chapters and you actually give the description of what you would like to see in each chapter. And then there will be a part two and then we'll, there will be a part three. And then you ask your potential contributor, you say, the first thing we want to have from you, do you think this is a good way to organize the different chapters, the different themes that will be presented in the workshop? Because now I'm an assumption that we're going for a workshop and not for a conference. We would like to enjoy your wisdom, maybe the lacuna, maybe we haven't thought about something, maybe the way we've defined this chapter or that chapter is not the optimal way. So first of all, you are getting feedback from people who you turn to who are obviously knowledgeable and creative and thoughtful in the field. And secondly, you're engaging them. You are making this a collective project where people are invested in the project in which they are going to contribute. The second thing is you say to them, we had in mind based on your previous writing that you would be an ideal author to contribute to chapter seven. Now the question, and here you have to be, of course you write it in a very elegant way. You don't want to unnecessarily bruise egos. Do you think this is the right place for you to make a contribution or is there a different chapter that you think you might contribute? So that's why the, uh, you might want to uh, not send all the invitation in one go so that you have a little bit and pick and choose. And then comes the critical uh, question. And again, you, there's all kinds of elegant ways of phrasing it. We turn it to you because of your writing in this field in the previous thing. But do you have the time and do you have the wish to move from where you are and to write a really new original contribution that will not simply be, uh, you wouldn't say it in such brutal words, will not simply be a recycled version of what you already published with which the field, our readers are already familiar. And you really have to put them on the spot that somebody has to sit back and think, A, do I really want to do it? Because it's not just going to be a conference where I can go and they stuck with what I present. And then it's too late to say this is not what we had in mind. I really have to be able to tell them what responsibility. Yes, I like the plan of the book. Yes, I think this is the right chapter for me. Yes, I'm willing to invest time, research, writing to make an original uh, contribution. So that is my third point in the Decalogue. It's the mission statement to the contributors is very different from the mission statement for which you started the project. You have to get them involved. You have to make it a collective and you have to make sure that they're comfortable with what you're asking them to do, that they have the time to do it that they're willing to do it. It doesn't always deliver, but it enhances the chances that you will get something that you really want and the overall quality of the book will be improved. Uh, point number four in the Decalogue is choosing the contributors. So here yeah, I'm not going to be categorical. There are different ways of going about it. One is to have a call for papers. A call for papers is you put out the mission statement and you invite people to send in proposals, a sort of abstract of 100, 200, 300 words. And then you choose the best ones that come your way. And then you have your workshop. You warn people that not all papers will get in. And uh, you hope that at the end of the day, you will have a good book based on the promise that is presented in the abstracts in the call for papers. I must say, I've tried this several times in the past and in the recent past, it's a double-edged sword because it's very difficult to know from the abstract what eventually we will be the quality of the writing, et cetera. But it's one way of going about it. It has the advantage that it's more inclusive, that it's not old boy network, that you might get voices from people that you're not familiar with, from young people, different areas of the world, etc. So it's one approach to take, but you have to be ready 
uh, that not everybody will deliver either exactly what the abstract said or at the quality of academic writing that you expect. So it's good if you go down this route to build in redundancy. In other words, you're imagining 10 chapters have 20 people come and present. The other approach is just to invite the people based on your knowledge and expertise in the field who are very good people writing. And then I've already hinted to that once or twice before in speaking, there's really the dilemma. The big names give visibility. You think maybe if people see their names, they will be more inclined to write the book. It will certainly, you think, enhance the prestige of the conference. If you say that Bruce Ackerman is participating, then everybody else will want to participate, uh, et cetera. But very, very often, the big names, the Puba, disappoint. They do what they want. They're not amenable to your comments. Very often, it's just recycling their old set of ideas. They write well, they experience, but it's not what you imagine. So it might be better to maybe have one or two or three, especially if there's people you know and trust and they, you, you can tell them, we really want you to deliver on this one. But go to people at a much earlier stage in their career, because very often they are much more on top of the literature than the old geezers, like myself. Uh, they've just finished their postdoc, etc. They've been reading everything, etc. Uh, they're more ambitious. They know this is important, etc. So thought has to be given, careful thought has to be given, who will I be choosing to contribute and not necessarily just the usual suspects. Oh, I'm so delighted I managed to get X from Oxford and Y from Yale and she's so good, etc. But think carefully who really will produce the kind of product that you are after the production. Now, point number five in the Decalogue, uh, organizing the workshop. My preference is to absolutely insist with people we don't want the final version of the paper. Because once people send the final version of the paper, they think they're done with, they'll get some comments, they will add a few footnotes, there will be a little bit of cut and paste, you will get, but they're not amenable to really radical change, to real improvement. This is what I've presented. That's what happens in one of these big conferences. You tell them what you want to, they come, they present the paper, you stuck with it. So my recommendation here is to tell the participants in the workshop, we want a draft of 5,000 words, so even 4,000 words. The eventual chapter, your chapter will have between 10 and 12,000 words. But for the workshop, we want four to 5,000 words. And you explain to them why. You, you say, because we don't want you to fall in love with your text yet. We want you to be amenable to suggestions that come throughout the workshop, through the workshop. Uh, and there's another advantage, which is not trivial, although it sounds trivial. You want all participants in the workshop ahead of the workshop to read all papers. And sending around 10 papers of 4,000 words is not sending around 10 papers of 12,000 words in terms of the ability of people really to prepare to the workshop and read all of them. You want to have a very strict deadline. And again, you manage expectations and you explain the reason. You say, we really need your drafts of four or 5,000 words at least three weeks before the conference. And the reason is you want your paper to be read by the other participants. They will need time and you will need to read all the papers. So it's really very, very important to get these drafts three or four weeks before the actual workshop because you're responsibilizing people to read all the papers ahead of the workshop. Uh, now, the way I think, and this is just one way, it's kind of a theme one, which might have many variations. Apart from having everybody in the workshop reading all the papers so that the discussion can be an informed discussion and real serious feedback uh, is given, you appoint from the participants in the workshop uh, commentators on each paper. So the commentators are not extraneous as we have in a conference, but the authors of chapters one and two will be the commentators on chapter three and four. And you insist, you request, you go on your knees, you beg any way you want to do it, that these comments have to be in writing because after the conference, after the workshop, they will be sent to each author because you know, people hear what they want to hear. And if you send it to, in writing, they really see the comments. And the comments should be in a way in the manner of peer review. In other words, 
these are your thoughts, here are my thoughts. If I wrote the paper, this is what I write, but I understand what you're trying to do. Here are some problems with your paper. Here is a kind of roadmap of what you might want to do when you do go from 5,000 to 10,000 or 12,000 in order to make it the strongest paper. You have to manage time realistically. In the conferences, we all know that's the blight of the conferences. Too many speakers, not an, nobody respects the time. The discussion is perfunctory. The 10, 15 minutes for questions, there's no real input. So to have at least one hour for discussion on a paper, in my view, is a minimum. And the way you do it is you don't have the person present their paper because the assumption is that everybody has read it. And if everybody knows in advance that they won't be presenting their paper, then it kind of creates a good uh, prisoner's dilemma or enlightened self-interest. So I need to read other papers because I want them to read my papers in order to get uh, input. What you ask the presenter of the paper to do is to start a five or at most 10 minutes presentation, not of the paper, this is what I'm trying to do, et cetera. But I assume you've all read the paper. These are the problems I'm facing. These are the questions that I haven't resolved in my mind where I would really appreciate your, in, your input. Once again, it creates the feeling of a collective enterprise of mutual responsibility among the uh, contributors to the eventual book and a much, much more substantive discussion. Point number six in the Decalogue is the post workshop. So. Yes, and Professor uh, Weiler, if I, if I may, at this juncture of halfway through the Decalogue, just to remind participants that if you have questions for Professor Weiler to ask them in the Q&A section, we already have one question. So uh, just to let you know, Professor Weiler, and uh, we're about halfway through. So thank you. Thank you. And I'm really trying to finish uh, very briefly. So point number six in the Decalogue is the post-workshop. So one of the things you want to do is to have an assistant, maybe a graduate student or whatever, really make a very good summary of all the points that were made in the, uh, in the workshop on each paper. And then you collate these comments and you send to each author, here is a summary of the points and suggestions that were made to your paper during the workshop. So that each author, you can send it to all authors, but it's particularly important that each author gets the written comments from the commentators and gets the summary of the ideas and suggestions that were made during the conference. And then you set a deadline for the first full draft. Again, I think it's important to put people on notice. And here again, it's enlightened self-interest. Once people have done the work, they want their work to appear as soon as possible. So you have to give a realistic time to work from the 5,000 to the 10,000, maybe three months, four months, uh, is not an unreasonable time with the help of the comments you said them, you sent them. And then this is where it's one of the most difficult tasks. You are the editors. When you get the final, uh, this first draft, I don't want to say the final draft, you really have to go through it with a magnifying glass. That's your responsibility. It's your prestige. If the book is a good book, the credit will go to you. If it's a bad book, the demerit will go to you. You have to compare the paper. You have to compare the paper with the comments that were sent to see if the author really took them into account. And you might still have new points, et cetera. So you have to see yourself in a way in the role of an editor of a journal. Okay, this is a good paper. We want it. But there's still a lot that can be done to make it a better paper. And not hesitate to send to the author and say, really nice, good effort, but there's still some more work that needs to be done. Uh, it very, very rarely happens. And as I said in the opening remarks, it's very, very, very visible when you open these edited books that this kind of substantive editorial input by the editors of the book uh, is lacking. Uh, point number seven, the introduction. So I can be brief because I already mentioned it. Uh, the gold standard is Mauro Capaletti, the late Mauro Capaletti. You want to see a good introduction to a collective work. Look at his introduction to the Access to Justice project or to the Integration Through Law project. It's not just a roadmap. It's not just, well, European integration is very important. 
it's a very substantive contribution in its own right. But what makes it different from an autonomous substantive introduced, uh, it really builds on the contributions to the book. I, I, of all the Decalogue, I think this is probably the most important thing, that the editors really take the time, energy, and write a substantive introduction. That becomes the, the signature piece, the identity card of the whole book. The, the one piece, if nobody, very few people will read through the entire book, but the one piece that people will read, and then it might whet their appetite also to read other chapters, etc. So you can't be uh, flimsy, you can't be lazy, you can't be, well, I'll just write these kind of three, four page preface rather than a substantive introduction. Point number eight, publisher. Tricky. Really tricky. If you're lucky, you already have a publisher who is in principle willing to publish the book on the basis of the mission statement. And my advice is to send the publisher, not just the mission statement that you sent the, the money givers, but the mission statement that you plan to send to the contributors. In other words, this is the general idea. This is how we see the book. This will be the chapters. Here are potential contributors. You don't have them on board, etc. That's not always the case. Sometimes you have to market your book, etc. In the next issue of Iger and, and uh, Icon, there will be an editorial of mine on the issue, the tricky issue of copyright of edited books. Uh, you will see that I'm advocating, and it can be done, that this notion that the contributors to the edited book may not publish their own work anywhere else except in the edited book is nonsense. When you speak to the publishers, they never lose sales if people then publish a version of their contribution to the book in some journal, etc. If anything, it gives more visibility to the book because of course they will mention, they will say an earlier version of this appeared in a book, et cetera, et cetera. It both encourages your authors if they know that the copyright will not impede them from doing that uh, because they know that they're gonna invest a lot of work and it will not simply be in that edited book because everybody knows that the chance of edited book syncing is pretty high. So it's really, worth, uh, it's really worth insisting on that with your editor, with your publisher. And as I say in the editorial, in the next issue of Icon and Nigel, I have a long editorial explaining how you do this, how you make sure that you do not, uh, uh, how you make sure that you do not uh, restrict your authors from publishing their work or further versions of the work in other outlets and also don't cede the language rights to the editor. There's a standard clause, I have the rights in all languages of the book, just say no. You have the, the, the rights in the language in which the book. The reason is because if the book is a success and some publisher wants to publish a German version or an Italian version or a Slovenian version or whatever, your publisher will charge them translation rights. If you keep the rights to your edited book in all other languages and you approach publishers in other languages, you give them the translation rights for free and the chances is that a successful book will be translated into other languages increases. Point number nine in the Decalogue uh, marketing, don't rely on the publisher. They will do a lousy job of marketing and don't be embarrassed of getting your fingers dirty. Oh, marketing is vulgar, etc. So this is the time you can have a big conference. When the book is out or is about to be out, that's when you have the big conference because then you're presenting the book. If you can get 100 people to come, good. If you can get 200, even better. If you can get 300, fantastic. Because all this is publicity for the book that is just come out or is about to come out and creates interest and discussion around it. Speak to the contributors to the book. You have 10 contributors. Try and have a book presentation, a workshop on the, a book presentation in their institution, in their country, etc. It's not enough. This I learned from John Sexton. It's not enough that it's good. People have to know that it's good. And people will not know that it's good if there's not serious vulgar word marketing. And you as editor have to really take charge of the marketing and not just think that the publisher will do it for you because the publisher will not do it for you. Finally, point number 10 is book reviewing. Uh, 
don't send the book to a book review editor and say, I have this reviewer in mind. It probably kills the chance that the book will be reviewed. But you should not be embarrassed to write a personal letter to the book review editors of the relevant journals and say, I just want to bring to your attention that we have published this book. This is, we think, succinctly, one or two paragraphs, the contribution of the book to the field, and we're hoping that your journal will organize for a book review. You do this, the chances is are greater that it will actually be pack, picked up. If you whet the appetite of the book review editor so they don't just get the book from the publishers. You know how many books we get every week from publishers, 80% of them being edited book and 20% being monograph? It's a huge amount. So it becomes a lottery. How do you pick from all these books? It what catches the fancy of the book review editor. If you send a nice succinct letter and say, we really think it's an important book, we hope it will be reviewed, you've increased your chances of the book being reviewed. And that of course is very important because a well-reviewed book will increase the impact, the readership and all the rest. I promised online or in person. I think if you do the workshop route that I proposed, then a, an online workshop works well. Because if you have 15 people on a Zoom conference, the input can be the same. Everything can be the same as if they are in the room, except they are not in the room. They're seeing each other on the screen. The key is not to have too many people. Uh, the big conference, the kind of webinar thing for the purposes of the edited book, I think is a dead loss. The only time to do it is once the book is out or is about to be out in what I said is the post-publication conference as kind of a marketing device rather than a substantive input into the production, uh, into the production of a good uh, book. And quite frankly, uh, if you have the workshop on Zoom, even without COVID, it saves an awful lot of money. So the last word on the vulgar point money. I think you should, if you have a research fund, if you've got a subvention for this project, which is result to a book, one of the best ways to spend that money is publishers to reduce the price of a book. The books that have a chance of not just collecting dust on library shelves, but actually people might buy them and read them cannot be priced at more than 30 euro. 29.95 is better than 30. And that is subject to negotiation. So if the publisher really believes in the book, they might do it themselves. You should forget royalties. You just negotiate your royalties away and any royalties to the contributors if they're given by saying, we're not gonna take royalties, we want you to reduce the price of the book. And if you have money to subsidize the book and in that way to reduce the cost, in my view, it's a good way to use that money. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Professor Weiler. Thank you so much. As, as always, you've also given us a great framework for thinking about uh, this issue and how to produce a great edited uh, book. So we have a, a number of questions from our audience, which I will begin to pose to you. Uh, so uh, the first question is from Irina Domorath, and she asks about, the causes of the decreasing quality of edited volumes. How do we ensure quality without jeopardizing career advancement? So she makes reference to the well-known pressure for publishing in order to get tenure and often two to three year employment contracts. So how do you balance that practical two to three year you know, work with the two years or more that you mentioned as part of the planning for an edited uh, volume? You might think that my answer is facetious, but it's not facetious. So advice number one, if you're a young scholar at the beginning of your career, don't do an edited book. It will take an awful lot of energy and time. It's always a zero sum game. There's an opportunity cost. You're working on the contrast, you're working on the workshop, the organization, the writing to authors, etc. If you're at the beginning of your career, you might be less known than you will be in five or 10 years, etc. So your leverage over your contributors is reduced. And for the most part, an edited book 
might cut favor with your dean because it's another publication, but it will only in very limited circumstances will enhance your intellectual and academic reputation in the field. So it sounds facetious, but it's not. If you, at an early stage of your career, don't get into the business of producing an edited book. And think twice or three times before you accept an invitation to contribute to an edited book. Because what you have to weigh is, okay, I feel important, I feel honored, there will be a lot of people there, etc. But I have to squeeze it in among other projects I'm doing. It's not my agenda, it's the agenda of the edited books. So I lose my sovereignty as a scholar that I'm determining my own agenda. It might not be the best quality that I can produce, so I might actually harm my reputation. So you really have to think very carefully if you want to contribute to the edited book, and you only do it if it really fits into your own research agenda and research plan, so it doesn't become counterproductive in that sense. If you can tick all those boxes, then accept to contribute to the edited book. It will be fun to go to Zagreb or to go to Moscow, wherever the workshop or the conference is, you will meet some interesting people, you can cut a bella figura, but remember it comes with a cost and the superficial uh, gratification, wow, I'm invited, it's an important edited book, might be counterweighed by the negatives that I just mentioned. Thank you so much. And that also answers uh, another question we had posed from Max Stoyer about what is, what if any is the value of participating uh, as a contributor, uh, particularly for junior scholars in text, in, in edited books, but he also asks about textbooks or handbook projects. Uh, do you have any further advice on that, Professor Weiler? So that we will need to do another webinar, but not in the next few months. We are all zoomed out because the whole uh, issue of handbooks is really interesting. There's an explosion of handbooks. There used to be a handbook on agriculture. Now there's a handbook on wheat and a handbook on barley and a handbook on corn, etc. And the reason there's an explosion of handbooks is because the publishers who also have to make money, including the prestigious university presses, which are really, they also have a bottom line. They've discovered that handbooks sell well, that libraries feel obliged to buy handbooks. So their captive market for handbooks is much larger than their captive markets for the odd edited book. So that's why there are so many handbooks. And handbooks do have a utility. I use handbooks because it's like the original Max Planck Encyclopedia of International Law. When you're starting doing your research, etc., the first place you go to is that kind of handbook. Or sometimes even Wikipedia. Some of the entries in Wikipedia are really good, some are terrible. But so it's a different calculus of contributing to a handbook, I would say that I would be more inclined in advice to younger scholars to contribute to a handbook than to contribute to an odd edited book, unless, as I said in my previous answer, the contribution that you are asked to make to the edited book really sits well with something that you would be interested in wanting to do and you could produce it and be aware of the copyright issue. You really have to make sure that even though you've contributed to the book, you could use a version of that paper in which you invested time and research and writing and editing uh, in a second version or third version, publish it in a journal, present it in a different conference, etc. But on the whole, I think handbooks are a more appealing proposition than the usual plethora of edited books. In fact, the, the edited books that succeed most are the edited books that resemble in some way a handbook, that they take an interesting topic and they cover it from different angles with uh, different contributors. Thank you. Another great point about how to uh, ensure good uh, edited books, which is another question which we recently received. So Professor Wiley, you spoke a little bit about the difference between or touched on perhaps publishing in a journal versus publishing in an edited uh, book. And a few of our questions have touched on uh, how do you decide whether to go for a quality edited book project or a journal special issue project. So perhaps you might elaborate a little bit more on the differences for our audience. Uh, I think that on the whole journals are more visible. So probably your piece will appear earlier 
and there's a better chance, especially if it's a quality journal. Uh, uh, I have to be careful here not to be glib or self-advertising, but the metric that we look at most uh, at ICON and EGIL uh, are not so much impact factor, which is a very misleading metric, although we do very well there too, uh, but the number of downloads, uh, not visits, but actual somebody downloading a PDF. And they are numbered in the thousands. Now, it's like in the old days, you could photocopy something and never read it. You just, once I photocopied, somehow I've done something. But there's a chance that if there are thousands of downloads, more people are actually looking at the pieces in the journal. So I think journal articles have more immediate and a broader impact than an editor book. I'm sure that more people see the table of contents and download PDFs uh, from journals than they do from edited books. The counterweight is that a good edited book which rises, and my hope is that if one follows at least some of the advice, or at least thinks in the direction that I've been presenting, there's a chance that your edited book or the edited book to which you contributed would rise, they have a much longer shelf life. So there are very few articles that really get remembered, et cetera, but a good book which is on the shelf will be consulted and people will take it off the shelf and will look into it, et cetera, years later than is the case with articles except with the very few articles which become famous or notorious, uh, et cetera. So that's the kind of calculus that you, you have to make. There's no magic formula. I don't have an algorithm for that but that's the way you want to think about it. The best is of course the best of the, both worlds and I'm not hesitating to say that. You publish in an edited book and then a second version of the article, that's why the copyright issue is so important. You publish a second version, a more developed version of your piece in some journal. As long as you're transparent, as long as the editor of the journal knows that this is a revised version of something that is about to appear or has appeared, then and I'm sure the editors of the book would not mind you because that we've really researched and we've argued with the publishers and we won that argument. It really does not, it's the fact that contributions to an edited book are subsequently published in journal articles, et cetera, does not reduce the sales of the book. If anything, it enhances the sales of the book. So those are the parameters you want to play with. But as I say, I have no algorithm. Thank you. Now we have two groups of questions, Professor Weiler, that have come in, one about young scholars and then the other about some practicalities related to the edited volume. So I'll pose the ones regarding young scholars first. Um, the first is obviously uh, that, you know, one of our attendees, Narissa Ramsundar, notes that, you know, young scholars face may face pressure to convene conferences and put forward collected editions to meet department mandates. So how might you advise those young scholars? And on a related point, um, Chon Moonen asks, well, many um, colleagues often organize a workshop and an accompanying edited volume together with their PhD students, focusing specifically on the PhD students' research. So is that a good strategy? So both questions related to junior scholars and, and young scholars. I don't want to kind of sign sound, highfalutin, idealist, etc. I'm very pragmatic and I'm very aware of the pressures that are put on young scholars today, which were not put on young scholars when I was a young scholar many, many decades ago. Uh, so one has to be practical. Uh, so for example, I used to tell uh, both in directing the PhD program at Harvard Law School and uh, more recently at NYU, I used to say to our PhD students, resist the temptation of writing articles while you're writing your PhD because your PhD is your identity card. And any article you write will rob you of between four and six months from your PhD. And again, it's, there's an opportunity cost, less time on the PhD, it will not be as good as it is. I've changed my advice because I know today, yes, because I know today you can't even get a postdoc if all you have to show is the PhD. They, to get a postdoc, you have to show a PhD plus some publications. So that's just to show that I, I am aware of the pressures and one has to take them into account. If there is departmental pressure to do an edited book, I think the workshop, 
and I will be publishing the advice I gave in a uh, future editorial of Icon and Egil, how to organize a good workshop, so you also have it in writing. I think I tried to give a roadmap of how, if you go, if there's pressure from the department, because my basic thing was avoid it. You're gonna have a long career ahead of you, establish yourself, and then there's a chance you will do a better edited book. But if there's pressure on you as a young scholar to do it, you have no option, you have to do it. So I'm hoping the advice I gave will maximize the chances of a good edited book, because at the end of the day, and I stand on this, not as an idealist, but really pragmatic, uh, I, I've sat on so many appointments committees and written references or asked advice from faculty in the process of giving tenure or promotion, etc. At the end of the day, quality trumps quantity. If you think who are the scholars in your field which you respect most, it will not be the people who have published 150 articles. It will be the two or three articles or the one book you've read from that scholar that your jaw dropped and you said, this is a fantastic article. This is really an impressive scholar, etc." And you want to be in that group. If you just put out in different work, satisfying the, the quota in different edited books, at the end of the day, it will come back to bite you. Because when people do look at it, they will say, hmm, is that all he or she can do? So it's between uh, whatever, the hammer and the anvil, etc. And I try to show a way today, if you are forced as a young scholar to do an edited book, although my advice is not only to a young scholar, also to established scholar, that was the way, in my view, that you can maxima uh, ensure. I think, forget the PhD students, you're not doing them a favor. You're taking them away from the PhD, etc. If you want to work with younger scholars, work with postdocs. Postdocs already have their PhD behind them. There's not the time pressure to finish in time, etc. If they're lucky, their PhD is now being processed into a book. It's people in the postdoc stage of their uh, emerging career that are very, very good contributors to edited books because they've just finished the PhD. They've read everything there is to read if they did a good job uh, in the field. And they, that is very, very promising for edited books. Thank you so much, Professor Weiler. So now to the practical questions that some of our attendees have, have posed. Uh, the first has to do with uh, late submissions. So I think this is something we've, uh, we've all had um, instances of, but in any event, uh, Eleni Francio asks, how would you advise treating the potential issue of significantly late submissions, assuming that enough time has been given to contributors in the first instance? And then uh, on a related note, Lourdes Peroni asks, uh, when neither the editors nor the contributors are native speakers, what would your suggestion be uh, on ensuring that the language is of high standards? So practical questions that also affect obviously the quality of the edited book. Two very good questions. And I don't have easy answers, but I have some experience of how to deal with it. So one way, one way to uh, address the late submission is to build in some redundancy to the project. In other words, to have some themes, especially the most important themes, where there's some overlap between the contribution. It will not harm the book if there's some overlap between uh, uh, different chapters. So, you know, in part one, instead of having three chapters, you might have four chapters. And the reason you do that, because if somebody drops out, either because they drop out or they deliver a really substandard uh, product that is not publishable, or they're so late and you send them the ultimatum and you say, uh, we can't wait longer. If we don't get it by such and such a date, we'll have to publish without you. It's not fatal to your book because you've built in some redundancy. So I have often done this and seen this done, and that's one way to deal. Uh, it's very difficult if the person who is late is, you know, somebody high up in the hierarchical world of academia, and especially if you're a young scholar, I mean, uh, 
but you that's one of the responsibilities you take as an edited book at some point you have to say look you are delaying the whole project we can give you another three weeks or whatever or another month but if you are unable to do it by then then uh, we'll have to go without you i think by making the 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 scholar aware that he or she are holding up the entire project puts on them quite a lot of moral pressure the problem is that what you get might not be of a good quality and then you're back to square one because then you have to write to them and say actually we don't like what you've written we don't think it will be good neither for you nor for the book it's unavoidable that's why i go back to my previous what i insisted was non-facetious advice if you're a young scholar and you're not absolutely forced by your dean to organize a conference and an edited book don't do it wait till you are more established in the field where you have the gravitas and the authority to be able to write in the manner that this kind of unacceptable delay creates. I must also confess that I have been in that position. Sometimes I've let editors down because I just was unable to deliver on time. Uh, it's quite horrible also as a contributor, but sometimes that happens. So that's uh, the redundancy. On the language, there's no silver bullet here. You can't publish uh, a, a piece which is written, uh, you know what I mean, it's uh, German in English, uh, etc., or English in French. It has to be well written, it has to read well, etc. So the copy editing will do some of that. But when you plan, when you budgeting your project, you might want to budget for people, native speakers, who will be language revisers. Uh, otherwise, you just that's what we do in the journals. That's what we do in ICON and EGIL. We don't do that kind of language revision. We write to the author and say, we like the content. It's a good article, but it's not well written in English. It's your responsibility to find a native speaker to go over it and put it into decent English or decent French or decent German or whatever the language might be. So again, no silver bullet, but that's the only way to deal with it. It doesn't pay anybody to publish a piece which might even in content be good, but is written in horrible language. You will always get the nasty comment by the book reviewer. Yes, thank, excellent point. Thank you, Professor Weiler. Um, now, the, our next two questions have to do with not necessarily the edited book, but with a complementary, I would say, um, publications. So the first uh, is, can you share some comments regarding the planning of Festschrift, so collections in honor of, of a scholar? And then the second one has to harkens back to your comments about the handbook how broad or deep should a law handbook be and historical and comparative and theoretical, et cetera, uh, or should it be more focused? So broad or, or narrow uh, for a handbook. So I, I really don't want to answer the handbook uh, because I haven't had enough time to think about it. And I, I will be thinking about it and writing about it sometime in the future. So what I will say here will just be off the cuff and not really meditated and metabolized thoughts about handbooks. On Festrif, so once again, in the very next issue of Icon and Agile, there will be a piece by me about Festrifter. And the basic advice is, if you are the person honored, say no. It's basically, it's a waste of time. Uh, except maybe in the German speaking world, people don't read Festrifter. They just honorific uh, doorstops. Uh, when you get an invitation to write to a festrif, you, you just say, oh my God, how am I going to get out of this without offending the honoree, etc. Very, very few festrifts rise, even less than your normal edited book. Uh, so here my advice is categorical. You might not agree, but it's mostly addressed to the people in whose honor the festrif is written because there's this conceit that it's a secret, they don't know, etc. Most of the time they do know. And it's worthwhile knowing because if you're going to issue invitations, you don't want to forget somebody that the honoree would really like to have invited, etc. But the advice is just say no to festrifting. It's just, it used to be that it was 
a rare occasion. Really very few people in the past, if you look 50 years ago, 60 years ago, would get a festive, especially outside the German speaking. Now everybody who reaches the age of 65, they feel insulted if there's no festive. Get rid of that, get over it. Uh, it's not worth the trouble. And if you invited to contribute, unless this is your own professor or somebody with whom you have a personal relationship and they will be uh, insulted if you didn't contribute it, how could it be that you didn't contribute to my festive? I would say even more than with edited books, just say no. Let's try and stamp out this horrible practice of uh, festschriften. I don't think you will take it as bragging, but you know, I'm scratching 70. So of course, several friends, students, etc., said, we want to do a festschrift for you. And I just wrote back and said, please, please don't. Let's have a nice party, but don't do a festschrift. It's Thank you. Direct and, and needed advice at times for Sarah. Thank you. Well, if uh, may I ask the audience if there are any uh, further further questions? Uh, oh, one more practical question, Professor Weiler. Uh, so, oh, is, is it a good idea to keep your contributors updated on the stage of the publication? So how do you boost the enterprise model of the edited uh, book? So you just spoke a lot about having, you know, all the contributors feel invested in um, the final product. So how is it that you uh, balance, if you will, this need to keep every, this desire to keep uh, everyone informed and invested and yet really, uh, you know, can allow the, the edited book to, to move along at a, at a uh, good pace? The question is the answer. Uh well, you can do too much of that, but regular updating is very important for the reason you gave to make people feel again and again that this is a collective on enterprise that they all invested. Because then also when the book comes out, they will be invested in promoting it in talking about it in sending it out for reviews to journals in maybe in countries, etc., cetera, with which you are not familiar as the editor. But also it's a not so subtle way of saying so far, we've received six of the nine contributions. So the three that have not sent, it's kind of not so subtle pressure on them. Hey, note, you don't have to re mention names. Hey, note that uh, you are the ones that are holding up the book. So I think regular updating of where the project stands, what's happening, etc., is a very good advice. Excellent. Um, well, do may I ask, are there any, oh, there is, Oh, that we're, so we're um, many attendees, Professor Weller, I thank you so much for the informative talk and for the great information you've provided. So uh, okay. if I just may ask the audience if there are any other uh, questions, if you have them, please type them in the, in the Q&A. And Perhaps while, we wait, while yeah. we're waiting for that, I have to, this, this event is organized by ICONES. And I suppose that most of the people participating are members of... Uh, of ICONES. And you all know that because of COVID, we had to uh, postpone for one year our conference in Wroclaw, which we had the highest number of registrants. There were 1,200 people who passed their credit card and registered to come to Wroclaw. So we don't want there just to be a hiatus of an entire year until we meet, hopefully, uh, in Wroclaw next year. So ICONES, the, uh, the presidents and secretary general, et cetera, have asked me, and I do this really willingness, uh, they are really open to suggestions and initiatives of things that can be done, uh, including online, including Zoom, like this event, which uh, would keep uh, the society vibrant, even uh, you know, love in the period, in the time of coronavirus. So, they're very, very welcoming and opening, open to suggestions of any initiatives that comes from our wonderful membership. Thank you, Professor Weiler. And I see that uh, we are, ha we are uh, receiving many thanks in the uh, Q&A and chat box and no further questions. So if there are no further questions, I will thank you so much, Professor Weiler, as always, as, as I said at the beginning, my 
uh, colleagues and I as junior scholars always look forward to your workshop because we learn so much, uh, especially as you say, the practical, really pragmatic, important things that we should keep in mind as we work in our own uh, ivory intellectual towers, as it were. So thank you so much. And I'd just like to take a moment too to thank uh, Fred and uh, Andy and Claudia who helped to organize this uh, event and encourage everyone to keep attending our Icon Ask Live uh, events. We will have many more. And thank you all so much for being a wonderful part of our Icon Ask community. And thank you above all to you, Felicia. Oh, thank you, Professor Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs>